The Coming of Sir Galahad by Beatrice Clay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Coming of Sir Galahad. Many times had the Feast of Pentecost come round, and many were the knights that Arthur had made since first he founded the Order of the Round Table. Yet no knight had appeared who dared claim the seat named by Merlin, the Siege Perilous. At last, one vigil of the great feast, a lady came to Arthur's court at Camelot, and asked Sir Lancelot to ride with her into the forest hard by, for a purpose not then to be revealed. Lancelot consenting, they rode together until they came to a nunnery hidden deep in the forest, and there the lady bade Lancelot dismount, and led him into a great and stately room. Presently there entered twelve nuns, and with them a youth, the fairest that Lancelot had ever seen. Sir, said the nuns, we have brought up this child in our midst, and now that he has grown to manhood, we pray you make him knight, for of none worthier could he receive the honour. Is this thy own desire? asked Lancelot of this young squire, and when he said that it was so, Lancelot promised to make him knight after the great feast festival had been celebrated in the church next day. So on the morrow, after they had worshipped, Lancelot knighted Galahad, for that was the youth's name, and asked him if he would ride at once with him to the king's court. But the young knight excusing himself, Sir Lancelot rode back alone to Camelot, where all rejoiced that he was returned in time to keep the feast with the whole order of the round table. Now, according to his custom, King Arthur was waiting for some marvel to befall before he and his knights sat down to the banquet. Presently, a squire entered the hall and said, Sir King, a great wonder has appeared. There floats on the river a mighty stone, as it were a block of red marble, and it is thrust through by a sword, the hilt of which is set thick with precious stones. On hearing this, the king and all his knights went forth to view the stone, and found it as the squire had said. Moreover, looking closer, they read these words, None shall draw me hence but only he by whose side I must hang, and he should be the best knight in all the world. Immediately, all bade Lancelot draw forth the sword, but he refused, saying that the sword was not for him. Then at the king's command, Sir Gawain made the attempt and failed, as did Sir Percival after him, so the knights knew the adventure was not for them, and returning to the hall, took their places about the round table. No sooner were they seated than an aged man, clothed all in white, entered the hall, followed by a young knight in red armour, by whose side hung an empty scabbard. The old man approached King Arthur, and bowing low before him, said, Sir, I bring you a young knight of the house, and lineage of Joseph of Arimathea, and through him shall great glory be won for all the land of Britain. Greatly did King Arthur rejoice to hear this, and welcomed the two right royally. Then, when the young knight had saluted the king, the old man led him to the Siege Perilous, and drew off its silken cover, and all the knights were amazed, for they saw that where had been engraved the words, The Siege Perilous, was written now in shining gold, This is the siege of the noble prince, Sir Galahad. Straight away the young man seated himself there where none other had ever sat without danger to his life, and all who saw it said, one to another, Surely... This is he that shall achieve the Holy Grail. Now the Holy Grail was the blessed dish from which our Lord had eaten the Last Supper, and it had been brought to the land of Britain by Joseph of Arimathea. But because of men's sinfulness, it had been withdrawn from human sight, only that from time to time it appeared to the pure in heart. When all had partaken of the royal banquet, King Arthur bade Sir Galahad come with him to the river's brink, and showing him the floating stone with the sword thrust through it, told him how his knights had failed to draw forth the sword. Sir, said Galahad, it is no marvel that they failed, for the adventure was meant for me, as my empty scabbard shows. So saying, lightly he drew the sword of the heart of the stone, and lightly he slid it into the scabbard at his side. While all yet wondered at this adventure of the sword, there came riding to them a lady on a white palfrey who, saluting King Arthur, said, Sir King, Nacian the hermit sends thee word that this day shall great honour be shown to thee and all thine house, for the holy grail shall appear in thy hall, 
and thou and all thy fellowship shall be read therefrom. And to Lancelot she said, Sir Knight, thou hast ever been the best knight of all the world, but another has come to whom thou must yield precedence. Then Lancelot answered humbly, I know well I was never the best. I, of a truth thou wast and art still of sinful men, said she, and rode away before any could question her further. So that evening, when all were gathered around the round table, each knight in his own siege, suddenly there was heard a crash of thunder, so mighty that the hall trembled, and there flashed into the hall a sunbeam, brighter far than any that had ever been seen, and then draped all in white summit, there glided through the air what none might see, yet what all knew to be the Holy Grail. And all the air was filled with sweet odours, and on every one was shed a light in which he looked fairer and nobler than ever before. So they sat in an amazed silence, till presently King Arthur rose and gave thanks to God for the grace given to him and to his court. Then up sprang Sir Gwain, and made his avow to follow for a year and a day the quest of the Holy Grail, if perchance he might be granted the vision of it. Immediately other of the knights followed his example, binding themselves to the quest of the Holy Grail, until, in all, one hundred and fifty had vowed themselves to the adventure. Then was King Arthur grieved, for he foresaw the ruin of his noble order, and turning to Sir Gawain, he said, Nephew, you have done ill, for through you I am bereft of the noblest company of knights that ever brought honour to any realm in Christendom. Well, I know that never again shall all of you gather in this hall, and it grieves me to lose men I have loved as my life, and through whom I have won peace and righteousness for all my realm. So the king mourned, and his knights with him, but their oaths they could not recall. End of The Coming of Sir Galahad by Beatrice Clay How Sir Galahad Won the Red Cross Shield by Beatrice Clay This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How Sir Galahad Won the Red Cross Shield Great woe was there in Camelot next day when, after worship in the cathedral, the knights who had vowed themselves to the quest of the Holy Grail got to horse and rode away. A goodly company it was that passed through the streets, the townsfolk weeping to see them go. Sir Lancelot de Luc and his kin, Sir Galahad, of whom all expected great deeds, Sir Bors and Sir Percival, and many others scarcely less famed than they. So they rode together that day to the castle of Vagon, where they were entertained right hospitably, and the next day they separated, each to ride his own way and see what adventures should befall him. So it came to pass that, after four days' ride, Sir Galahad reached an abbey. Now Sir Galahad was still clothed in red armour, as when he came to the king's court, and by his side hung the wondrous sword. But he was without a shield. They of the abbey received him right heartily, as also did the brave King Bagdemagus, knight of the round table, who was resting there. When they had greeted each other, Sir Galahad asked King Bagdemagus what adventure had brought him there. Sir, said Bagdemagus, I was told that in this abbey was preserved a wondrous shield, which none but the best knight in the world might bear without grievous harm to himself. And though I know well that there are better knights than I, tomorrow I purpose to make the attempt. But I pray you, bide at this monastery a while until you hear from me, and if I fail, do ye take the adventure upon you. So be it, said Sir Galahad. The next day, at their request, Sir Galahad and King Bagdemagus were led into the church by a monk, and shown where, behind the altar, hung the wondrous shield, whiter than snow save for the blood-red cross in its midst. Then the monk warned them of the danger to any who, being unworthy, should dare to bear the shield. But King Bagdemagus made answer, I know well that I am not the best knight in the world, yet will I try if I may bear it. So he hung it about his neck, and, bidding farewell, rode away with his squire, the two had not journeyed far before they saw a knight approach, armed all in white mail and mounted upon a white horse. Immediately he laid his spear in rest, and charging King Bagdemagus, pierced him through the shoulder and bore him from his horse. And standing over the wounded knight, he said, Knight, 
thou hast shown great folly, for none shall bear this shield save the peerless knight, Sir Galahad. Then, taking the shield, he gave it to the squire and said, Bear this shield to the good knight Galahad, and greet him well from me. What is your name? asked the squire. That is not for thee or any other to know. One thing, I pray you, said the squire. Why may the shield be borne by none but Sir Galahad without danger? Because it belongs to him only, answered the stranger knight, and vanished. Then the squire took the shield, and, setting King Bagdemagus on his horse, bore him back to the abbey where he lay long, sick unto death. To Galahad the squire gave the shield, and told him all that had befallen. So Galahad hung the shield about his neck, and rode the way that Bagdemagus had gone the day before, and presently he met the white knight, whom he greeted courteously, begging that he would make known to him the marvels of the red cross shield. That will I gladly, answered the white knight. Ye must know, sir knight, that the shield was made and given by Joseph of Arimathea to the good king Everlake of Saras. That, in the might of the holy symbol, he should overthrow the heathen who threatened his kingdom. But afterwards, King Everlake followed Joseph to this land of Britain, where they taught the true faith unto the people who before were heathen. Then, when Joseph lay dying, he bade King Everlake set the shield in the monastery, where ye lay last night, and foretold him that none should wear it without loss, until that day when it should be taken by the knight, ninth and last in descent from him, who should come to that place the fifteenth day after receiving the degree of knighthood. Even so has it been with you, Sir Knight. So saying, the unknown knight disappeared, and Sir Galahad rode on his way. End of How Sir Galahad Won the Red Cross Shield by Beatrice Clay How Ethne Quitted Fairyland by T. W. Rolleston This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How Ethne Quitted Fairyland By the banks of the River Boyne, where rises the great fairy mound now called Newgrange, there stood long ago the shining palace of a prince of the people of Dana, named Angus. Of him it is that the lines are written by the dark rolling waters of the Boyne, where Angus Og magnificently dwells. When the Milesian race invaded Ireland, and after long fighting subdued the Danans, in spite of all their enchantments and all their valor, the Danans wrought for themselves certain charms by which they and all their possessions became invisible to mortals, and thus they continued to lead their old joyous life in the holy places of the land, and their palaces, and dancing places and folk motes seemed to the human eye to be merely a green mound or wrath, or a lonely hillside, or a ruined shrine with nettles and foxgloves growing up among its broken masonry. Now, after Angus and his folk had thus retreated behind the veil of invisibility, it happened that the steward of his palace had a daughter born to him, whose name was Ethne. On the same day, Fand, the wife of Manon the sea god, bore him a daughter, and since Angus was a friend of Manon, and much beloved by him, the child of the sea-god was sent to the Brug Naboinia, the noble dwelling-place of Angus, to be fostered and brought up, as the custom was. And Ethne became the handmaid of the young princess of the sea. In time, Ethne grew into a fair and stately maiden. Now in the Brug of Angus there were two magical treasures— namely an ale-vat which could never be emptied, and two swine whereof one was ever roasted and ready to be eaten while the other lived, and thus they were, day and day about. There was, therefore, always a store of food of fairy, charged with magical spells, by eating of which one could never grow old or die. It came to be noticed that after Ethne had grown up, she never ate or drank the fairy food, or of any other, Yet she continued to seem healthy and well-nourished. This was reported to Angus, and by him to Menan, and Menan, by his wisdom, discovered the cause of it. One of the lords of the Danans, happening to be on a visit with Angus, 
was rendered distraught by the maiden's beauty, and one day he laid hands upon her and strove to carry her away to his own dwelling. Ethne escaped from him, but the blaze of resentment at the insult that lit up in her soul consumed in her the fairy nature that knows not of good or evil, and the nature of the children of Adam took its place. Therefore she ate not of the fairy food, which is prohibited to man, and she was nourished miraculously by the will of the one God. But after a time it chanced that Manan and Angus brought from the holy land two cows whose milk could never run dry. In this milk there was nothing of the fairy spell, and Ethne lived upon it many long years, milking the cows herself, nor did her youth and beauty suffer any change. Now it happened that on one very hot day the daughter of Manan went down to bathe in the waters of the Boyne, and Ethne and her other maidens along with her. After they had refreshed themselves in the cool, amber-colored water, they arrayed themselves in their silken robes and trooped back to the brook again. But ere they entered it, they discovered that Ethne was not among them. So they went back, scattering themselves along the bank and searching in every quiet pool of the river and in every dark recess among the great trees that bordered it, for Ethne was dearly loved by all of them. But neither trace nor tidings of her could they find, and they went sorrowfully home without her, to tell the tale to Angus and to her father. What had befallen Ethne was this. In taking off her garments by the riverside, she had mislaid her fairy charm, and was become a mortal maid. Nothing could she now see of her companions, and all around was strange to her. The fairy track that had led to the riverside was overgrown with briars. The palace of Angus was but a wooded hill. She knew not where she was, and pierced with sudden terror, she fled wildly away, seeking for the familiar places that she had known in the fairy life, but which were now behind the veil." At length she came to a high wall wherein was a wicker gate, and through it she saw a garden full of sweet herbs and flowers, which surrounded a steep-roofed building of stone. In the garden she saw a man in a long brown robe, tied about his waist with a cord. He smiled at her, and beckoned her to come in without fear. He was a monk of the Holy Patrick, and the house was a convent church. When the monk had heard her tale, he marveled greatly and brought her to St. Patrick himself, who instructed her in the faith, and she believed and was baptized. But not long thereafter, as she was praying in the church by the Boyne, the sky darkened, and she heard a sound without like the rushing of a great wind, and mingled in it were the cries and lamentations, and her own name called again and again in a multitude of voices, thin and faint as the crying of curlews upon the moor. She sprang up and gazed about, calling in return, but nothing could she see, and at last the storm of cries died away, and everything was still again around the church, except the singing voice of Boyne and the humming of the garden bees. Then Ethne sank down swooning, and the monks bore her out into the air, and it was long until her heart beat and her eyes unclosed again. In that hour she fell into a sickness from which she never recovered. In no long time she died, with her head upon the breast of the Holy Patrick, and she was buried in the church where she had first been received by the monk, and the church was called Kilethne, or the Church of Ethne, from that day forward until now. End of How Ethne Quitted Fairyland by T. W. Rolleston. Arachne by Josephine Preston Peabody. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Arachne. Not among mortals alone were there contests of skill nor yet among the gods, like Pan and Apollo. Many sorrows befell men because they grew arrogant in their own devices and coveted divine honors. There was once a great hunter, Orion, 
who outvied the gods themselves till they took him away from his hunting grounds and set him in the heavens with his sword and belt and his hound at his heels but at length jealousy invaded even the peaceful arts and disaster came of spinning there was a certain maiden of lydia arachne by name renowned throughout the country for her skill as a weaver she was as nimble with her fingers as calypso that nymph who kept odysseus for seven years in her enchanted island she was as untiring as penelope the hero's wife who wove day after day while she watched for his return day in and day out arachne wove too the very nymphs would gather about her loom naiads from the water and dryads from the trees maiden they would say shaking the leaves or the foam from their hair in wonder pallas athena must have taught you but this did not please arachne she would not acknowledge herself a debtor even to that goddess who protected all household arts and by whose grace alone one had any skill in them i learned not of athena said she if she can weave better let her come and try the nymphs shivered at this and an aged woman who was looking on turned to arachne be more heedful of your words my daughter said she the goddess may pardon you if you ask forgiveness but do not strive for honors with the immortals arachne broke her thread and the shuttle stopped humming keep your counsel she said i fear not athena no nor any one else as she frowned at the old woman she was amazed to see her change suddenly into one tall majestic beautiful a maiden of gray eyes and golden hair crowned with a golden helmet it was athena herself the bystanders shrank in fear and reverence only arachne was unawed and held to her foolish boast in silence the two began to weave and the nymphs stole nearer coaxed by the sound of the shuttles that seemed to be humming with delight over the two webs back and forth like bees they gazed upon the loom where the goddess stood plying her task and they saw shapes and images come to bloom out of the wondrous colors as sunset clouds grow to be living creatures when we watch them and they saw that the goddess still merciful was spinning as a warning for arachne the pictures of her own triumph over reckless gods and mortals in one corner of the web she made a story of her conquest over the sea-god poseidon for the first king of athens had promised to dedicate the city to that god who should bestow upon it the most useful gift poseidon gave the horse but athena gave the olive means of livelihood symbol of peace and prosperity and the city was called after her name again she pictured a vain woman of troy who had been turned into a crane for disputing the palm of beauty with a goddess other corners of the web held similar images and the whole shone like a rainbow meanwhile arachne whose head was quite turned with vanity embroidered her web with stories against the gods making light of zeus himself and of apollo and portraying them as birds and beasts but she wove with marvellous skill the creatures seemed to breathe and speak yet it was all as fine as the gossamer that you find on the grass before rain athena herself was amazed not even her wrath at the girl's insolence could wholly overcome her wonder for an instant she stood entranced then she tore the web across and three times she touched arachne's forehead with her spindle live on arachne she said and since it is your glory to weave you and yours must weave forever so saying she sprinkled upon the maiden a certain magical potion away went arachne's beauty then her very human form shrank to that of a spider and so remained as a spider she spent all her days weaving and weaving and you may see something like her handiwork any day among the rafters end of arachne by josephine preston peabody recorded by colleen mcmahon Introduction to A Book of Giants, Tales of Very Tall Men of Myth, Legend, History, and Science, by Henry Wisham Lanier. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Giants, by Henry Wisham Lanier. Introduction. Man in his youth was so fond of giants that, not finding them large or plentiful enough, he created a bounteous supply. He gave them precedence of himself. In the frozen north they came even before the gods, in the east after the celestials but before the creation of the world, 
In Greece, they sprang into being just after the Olympians and fiercely disputed with the sovereignty of Zeus. Many ancient gods were vast in size. Witness, for instance, the colossal statues of Egypt, China, or the South Seas. But the palm for bigness must go to those giant beings whom we find amid chaos in the east, like that Tiamat from whom the Babylonian god Bel formed heavens and earth, and Purushu of the Hindu Vedas, whose severed head was sufficient for making the sky, his feet for the earth, his eye for the sun, and his mind for the moon. Somehow, these are too large. Nowadays, one can hardly digest a giant like that. Even those huge and terrible beings with bodies of stone, who once descended upon the Iroquois Indians, seem more like jinn or rakshasas. They do not fascinate as does that monstrous black warder of the bridge at Mantrable, who is fifteen feet tall with tusks like a boar and head like a libeard. The scholars quarrel over the questions of whether or not the very word originally meant earthborn, but be that as it may, the giants exhibited in these pages, collected after a wider search than even Buster Barnum ever prosecuted for such prodigies, are all creatures of the earth, at least in part. Their feet are on the earth, even if like Og, king of Basham, their heads tower high enough to drink straight from the clouds. They all have a semblance of human beings, as they should. If this seems doubtful, remember Iabani. His story is certainly the first to be put on record, for it was baked in clay at least 2,500 years ago, the twelve tablets being found among King Arsurbani Pad's library at Nineveh. Iabani was a huge giant who lived with the wild animals and who defied every attempt to capture him, until King Gilgamesh abandoned force and sent a very beautiful woman to stand quietly near one of the hairy creature's lurking places. At first sight of her, the colossal wild man falls in love, accompanies her meekly back to civilization, and, giving up his beloved forest, takes a humble second part in the subsequent stirring adventures of the king. No doubt about the human nature of that. Considering that he made them, it does seem as if man had been somewhat unfair to the giants. In the beginning, they won enduring glory. Typhon conquered Zeus in hand-to-hand -hand fight and drove the other gods to wander over Egypt disguised as animals. Even Atlas had at least the dignity of holding up the heavens on his head and hands forever. The Frost Giants more than once outwitted Thor and the other dwellers in Valhalla. And but the other day, historically speaking, Gargantua could swallow five pilgrims as a salad. But what a humiliating portion has been allotted to the successors of these awe-inspiring monsters. First they made gods tremble, then they were slain by demigods and heroes, next they became a measure of the prowess of every knight of chivalry. Presently they were the sport of the childish Jack the Giant Killer, and now, for a hundred years, we have relegated them to our circuses and museums. Worst of all, the wise men insist that giantism is merely a disease. It really isn't quite fair. Besides the inconvenience of being a giant, just think of the difficulty of getting enough to eat and clothes to wear, what a disgrace to have one's head inevitably cut off by some little whippersnapper up to one's waist or knees. And then to be such a byword for stupidity. Amasis, who used to kill each newcomer with a single blow, was at once dispatched by Polydeuces, the skillful boxer. That sort of an awkward ineffectiveness was bad enough, but what of Polyphemus, who had not sense enough to explain to his cyclop brethren the transparent trick of Ulysses in calling himself No Man? One can't help feeling sorry for such helpless hulks. And perhaps the unkindest cut of all is the true tale related by Patien, the famous French surgeon. Quote, in the 17th century, in order to gratify a whim of the Empress of Austria, all the giants and dwarfs in the Germanic Empire were assembled at Vienna. As circumstances required that all should be housed in one building, it was feared that the imposing proportions of the giants should terrify the dwarves, and means were taken to assure the latter that they were perfectly safe. But the result was most unexpected. The dwarves teased, insulted, and even robbed the giants to such an extent that the latter complained in tears to the officials, and sentinels had to be stationed to protect them from their tiny comrades." Unquote. However, the fascination of these very tall men still continues, and these tales relate to the adventures of some of the famous of all ages and all lands. Those lovers of the colorful old days, who mourn the departure of the giants before the skeptical eye of science and the camera, may be comforted to learn that in the rugged country of northern Scotland, the folk are better informed than we. There, where Sutherland rocks meet the sea, East from Cape Wrath, the wise ancients will tell you that the giants are not really all dead, 
but only sleeping in the great hall of Alban. In proof whereof, know that a man of these parts once ventured into a great cave by the seashore. It opened to a vast and lofty apartment, where there were many huge men lying fast asleep on the stone floor. In the center of the room was a table, on which lay an ancient horn. The man put the horn to his lips and blew one blast. The enormous figure stirred. He blew a second time. One of the giants rubbed his eyes and said in a voice that rumbled through the cave, If you blow once more, we shall wake. The man fled in terror. Though by singular bad luck he could never again find the mouth of that cave, it is something to know that our tall friends are there, only waiting for three bold blasts to return to us. End of introduction. Legends of the City of Mexico, Legend of La Llorona, by Tomás Alibón Janvier. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Legends of the City of Mexico, Legend of La Llorona. As is generally known, señor, many bad things are met with by night in the streets of the city, but this wailing woman, La Llorona, is the very worst of them all. She is worse by far than the vaca del lumbre, that at midnight comes forth from the potrero of San Pablo and goes galloping through the streets like a blazing whirlwind, breathing forth from her nostrils smoke and sparks and flames. Because the fiery cow, señor, while a dangerous animal to look at, really does no harm whatever, and la llorona is as harmful as she can be. Seeing her walking quietly along the quiet street, at the times when she is not running and shrieking for her lost children, she seems a respectable person only odd-looking because of her white petticoat and the white rebozo with which her head is covered, and anybody might speak to her, but whoever does speak to her in that very same moment dies. The beginning of her was so long ago that no one knows when was the beginning of her, nor does anyone know anything about her at all, but it is known certainly that at the beginning of her, when she was a living woman, she committed bad sins. As soon as ever a child was born to her, she would throw it into one of the canals which surrounded the city, and so would drown it. And she had a great many children, and this practice in regard to them she continued for a long time. At last her conscience began to prick her about what she did with her children, but whether it was that the priest spoke to her, or that some of the saints cautioned her in the middle, no one knows. But it is certain that because of her sinning she began to go through the streets in the darkness weeping and wailing, and presently it was said that from that night till morning there was a wailing woman in the streets. And to see her, being in terror of her, Many people went forth at midnight, but none did see her, because she could be seen only when the street was deserted, and she was alone. Sometimes she would come to a sleeping watchman and would waken him by asking, What time is it? And he would see a woman clad in white standing beside him with her rebozo drawn over her face, and he would answer, It is twelve hours of the night. And she would say, At twelve hours of this day I must be in Guadalajara, or it might be in Juan Luis Potosí, or in some other far distant city, and, so speaking, she would shriek bitterly, Where shall I find my children? And would vanish instantly and utterly away. And the watchman would feel as though all his senses had gone from him, and would become a dead man. This happened many times to many watchmen, who made report of it to their officers, but their officers would not believe what they told. But it happened on a night that an officer of the watch was passing by the lonely street beside the church of Santa Anita, and there he met with the woman, wearing a white rebozo and a white petticoat, and to her he began to make love. He urged her by saying, Throw off your rebozo, so that I may see your pretty face. And suddenly she uncovered her face, and what he beheld was a bare grinning skull set fast to the bare bones of a skeleton. And while he looked at her, being in horror, there came from her fleshless jaws an icy breath, and the iciness of it froze the very heart's blood in him, and he fell to the earth heavily in a deathly swoon. When his senses came back to him, he was greatly troubled. In fear, he returned to the Diputación, and there told what had befallen him. And in a little while, his life forsook him, and he died. What is most wonderful about this wailing woman, señor, is that she is seen in the same moment by different people in places widely apart, one seeing her hurrying across the atrium of the cathedral, another beside the Arcos de San Cosme, and yet another near the Salto del Agua, over by the prison of Belén. More than that, in one single night she will be seen in Monterrey, in Oaxaca, in Acapulco, the whole width and length of the land apart, and whoever speaks with her in those far cities, as in here in Mexico, immediately dies of fright. 
Also, she has seen at times in the country. Once, some travelers coming along a lonely road met with her and asked, Where go you on this lonely road? And for answer she cried, Where shall I find my children? And shrieking disappeared. And one of the travelers went mad. Being come here to the city, they told what they had seen, and were told that the same wailing woman had maddened or killed many people here also. Because the wailing woman is so generally known, senor, and so greatly feared, few people now sob her when they meet with her, to speak with her. Therefore, few now die of her, and that is fortunate. But her loud, keen wailings and the sound of her running feet are heard often, and especially in nights of storm. I myself, senor, have heard the running of her feet and her wailings, but I never have seen her. God forbid that I ever shall. End of Legends of the City of Mexico Legend of La Llorona by Tomás Alibón Hanvier Chapter 1 of A Book of Giants Tales of Very Tall Men of Myth, Legend, History, and Science by Henry Wisham Lanier This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Giants by Henry Wisham Lanier Chapter 1. How Zeus Fought with Titans and Giants We think of Zeus as the mightiest god of Greece, accompanied by his servants' force, might, and victory, the cloud-gatherer, the rain-giver, the thunderer, the lightning-hurler, the sender of prodigies, the guider of stars, the ruler of other gods and men, whom even Poseidon the earth-shaker must obey. The very name reverberates with majesty, power, dominion. But the beginnings of this vast deity were in darkness and danger. True, the reign of his father Kronos was that golden age when, in the fresh morning of the world, quote, heat and cold were not yet at strife, the seasons had not begun their mystic dance, and one mild and equable climate stretched from pole to pole. When the trees bore fruit, and the vine her purple clusters all the year, and honeydew dripped from the laurel and juniper which are now so bitter, when flowers of every hue filled the air with perpetual fragrance, the lion gambled with the kid, and the unfanged serpent was as harmless as the dove. Unquote. When over curious Pandora, not yet having released her box full of ills, men had neither care nor sickness nor old age. But, after centuries of blissful calm, faded like flowers and became kindly spirit guardians of their successors. Yet amid this charming serenity, Cronos could never forget the curse of his father Uranus, whom he had overthrown, and the prophecy that he himself should in his turn be cast down by his own children. Wherefore, being resolved to defeat that prophecy, he swallowed each child his wife Rhea brought forth as soon as it was born. When Rhea had thus lost five babes, Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, and Poseidon, and knew herself about to bear yet another, she made her prayer to Uranus, her ancient sire, imploring counsel and aid but only a faint, vast murmur thrilled through the sky. My voice is but the voice of winds and tides. No more than winds and tides can I avail. Pray thou to thy puissant mother. In me, dispossessed of godhood, is no succor more. So the Titanus betook her to earth, and the mighty mother gave her counsel how to outwit grim Cronos and Rhea fled through the swift dark night to a secret thicket upon a hill of Arcadia. There was born a mighty babe, whom she called Zeus. At her prayer Mother Earth smote the mountain, and there gushed forth a bounding stream in which she laved the infant. Then she gave him to the nymph Neda, who bore him swiftly across the sea to Crate, hiding him in a cave upon a dense and wooded mountain named Ida. She entrusted the child to Adrestia and Ida, nymphs of the mountain, to be reared in secret. But Rhea took a huge stone and wrapped it in swaths and brought it to Kronos, then sovereign of the gods, saying, Behold, I have borne my lord another son. Nought said he, but snatched the stone and greedily swallowed it, nothing doubting that it was the newborn child. Thus his wife deceived him for all his cunning. Rhea might not so much as see her babe, lest Kronos should spy her from his throne on high. But the child throve, laid in a golden winnowing fan for a good omen, tended by the gentle nymphs, and nourished on the wild honey they gathered for him and on the milk of a mountain goat. Around him danced the fierce curetes, earth-born warriors, who performed their war dances, rattling and clashing their weapons whenever the infant cried, lest Cronos should overhear him. 
So the child Zeus increased daily in beauty and stature, nor was it long before he gave proof of his godhead in wondrous wise. Two years his goat foster mother suckled him, snow white she was, with jet black horns and hooves, the most beauteous of her kind, and her name was Amalthea. Then, on a day, while the young god played with her after his wont, he grasped one of her curved horns as she made pretense of butting, and broke it clean off. Tears stood in the creature's eyes, and she looked reproachfully on her fosterling. But the little god ran to her and threw his arms about her shaggy neck, bidding her be comforted, for he would make amends. With that he laid his right hand on the goat's head, and immediately a new horn sprouted, full grown. And he took up the horn he had broken and gave it to the nymphs, saying, Kindly nurses, in recompense of your care, Zeus gives you Amalthea's horn, which shall be to you a horn of plenty. As for her, when I come into my kingdom, I will be mindful of my foster mother. She shall not die, but be changed into one of the bright signs of heaven. Thus Zeus promised and fulfilled his word in the aftertime, for faithful and true are the promises of the immortals. But when the nymphs had taken the horn of Amalthea, behold, they found it brimful of all manner of luscious fruits, of the finest wheat flour and sweet butter and golden honeycomb. They shook all out, laughing in delight, and one cried, here were a feast for the gods, had we but wine thereto. No sooner said she this than the horn bubbled over with ruby wine, for this was the magic in it, that it never grew empty, and yielded its possessors whatsoever food or drink they desired. Now when Earth saw that Zeus was come to the prime of his mighty youth, she sent to him one of the daughters of Oceanus named Metis, which is, being interpreted, counsel. And Metis came and stood before him in the Idian mount and said, I have an errand unto thee, O king, that shalt be hereafter. And Zeus said, Is it a foe's errand or a friend's? Who sent thee hither, and who art thou? And she said, Metis is my name, a daughter of Oceanus the old, and my errand is from Earth the All-Mother. She bids thee take this herb I bring, and go straight to Kronos in his golden house on high. Tell him not who or whence thou art, but cause him to swallow the herb on weeting and it shall work mischief to him, and good to thee. Delay not, for the hour is at hand when Kronos must pay full measure for the outrage he did his sire, as it is ordained. Tell me, said Zeus, how knows earth that such an hour is at hand, and by whom is the vengeance ordained? Metis answered, There are three sisters, daughters of primeval night, grey virgins older than time, who sit forever in the shades of underground, spinning threads of divers colors from their golden distiffs. And the threads are the lives of gods and men. As the sisters twine them, sad-hued or bright, so was the lot of each living soul, mortal or immortal. There is none among the gods, nor shall be, that may escape the lot spun for him, nor avail to turn those spinners from their task. Hasting not, resting not, Without knowledge, without pity, the three fates work on. But as they twirl the spindles, they sing the song of the morrow, and earth, she only, understands that song. Hence it is she knows what is coming upon Kronos. Then Zeus arose and went up to the heavenly palace halls. There he found Kronos feasting and quaffing honey-colored nectar, wine of the gods. Kronos asked him who he was, and Zeus answered, I am Prometheus, son of Iapetus, thy brother, who greets thee well by me. Then Cronus bade him welcome, and they drank and caroused together. But when they had well drunk, Zeus put the herb of earth into his father's cup, unmarked of him. And Cronus no sooner swallowed it than a marvel past thought befell, for he disgorged from his giant maw first the stone Rhea gave him, which stone was ever afterwards preserved as a pious memorial at Delphi, and then her two sons and daughters, three, no longer babes, but full-grown. Forthwith Zeus made himself known to his brethren, and the young gods seized their father and bound him in chains. But ancient Kronos cried for aid to his titan kindred, with a voice like the tempest's roar, and they came swiftly in their might, and the young gods could not stand before them, but fled out of heaven to the cloudy top of Mount Olympus, that great peak robed in eternal snows. There they abode as in a citadel, and thence it is that Zeus and the family of Zeus are called the Olympians to this day. The Titans occupied Mount Othrys to the south, and the broad plains of Thessaly in between show even yet the shattered rocks and rent surface from the struggle which ensued. For now there was war in heaven, 
Ten years the Elder Gods fought against the Olympians, and neither side could win the mastery. But one amongst the Titans would not fight against Zeus, for being endued with wisdom and foresight about all gods, he perceived that the day of Kronos must shortly have an end, and his scepter passed to another. This was Prometheus, whom Asia, daughter of Oceanus, bore to Iapetus, son of Earth. Fain would he have dissuaded his father and brother from taking arms in a lost cause, and for the sake of one who, himself a usurper, must now reap as he had sown, but they would not heed, trusting in their own giant strength. At last Zeus sought counsel of Mother Earth, and she spake this oracle unto him out of the cave that is in Rocky Pytho. He that will conquer in this strife, let him set free the captives in Tartarus. For Earth had long borne Kronos a grudge, because he would not release the hundred-handed and the cyclopes from that abyss of darkness. Therefore she willingly revealed to Zeus the secret of victory. But naught knew he of those giants or their fate, nor so much as the name of Tartarus, which none among the heaven-dwelling gods will utter for very loathing. So the saying of Earth was dark to him, and he was much disheartened. Then Prometheus, knowing what had befallen, came to Zeus on Olympus and said, Son of Kronos, though fight I may not against my kin, fight against thee I will not, for that were idle folly, seeing the fates will have thee lord of all. Let there be peace between me and thee, and I will interpret the oracle Earth has given thee. Zeus heard him gladly and said, For this good turn, count me thy debtor and fast friend evermore. Then straightway they two fared through the underworld to the gates of unplumbed Tartarus, where by the titan's aid Zeus slew the snake Campe, their grisly warder, and delivered the captives. And amazed was the leader of the younger gods at the sight of these monstrous first children of earth. For each of the three hundred-handed, Briareus, Cotus, and Gygus, had moving ever from his shoulders a hundred arms, not brooking approach, while above this threatening display rose fifty heads. As for the Cyclopes, Brontes, Steropes, and Argus, they resembled the Titan, save that each had a single round eye in the center of his forehead. They had shown from birth such overbearing spirit and terrific strength, tossing whole hills with their forests about like balls, that even Uranus had feared them, and thrust them into Tartarus ere they were grown. Zeus rejoiced at these mighty allies, but fell fighters as they were, their greatest aid was not in their strength, but their skill. For the Cyclopes made themselves a smithy in the glowing heart of Mount Aetna, and where they wrought such gifts for their deliverers as only they could fashion. To Poseidon they gave his trident with prongs of adamant, and to Hades a cap of darkness whose wearer was invisible to gods and men, while for Zeus himself they forged the kingliest weapon of all, the thunderbolts and the blasting zigzagged lightning. Then Zeus set before them all the nectar and ambrosia of the gods and addressed them. Hear me, illustrious children of earth and heaven, that I may speak what my spirit within my breast prompts me to speak. For a very long time have we been fighting for the mastery, the titan gods and we who are sprung from Kronos. Now show your invincible might against the titans, in gratitude for your deliverance to the light from bondage in murky gloom. The blameless Cotus answered, Excellent lord, we are aware that thy wisdom is most high, and thy mind, and thou hast been to the immortals an averter of destruction. Wherefore, we will now protect thy dominion in fell conflict, fighting stoutly against the titans. And all the gods applauded, female as well as male, and they rushed to combat. The titans on their side were no less eager, and as the battle joined, the boundless sea re-echoed terribly, and earth resounded, and broad heavens groaned as it shook, and vast Olympus swayed on its base, and even to murky Tartarus came the hollow sound of feet and battle strokes. And as the two sides came together, their great war cry reached to the starry heaven above. Now Zeus loosed his fury, and the bolts with thunder and lightning shut so fast and fiercely from his mighty hand that earth crashed in conflagration, and the forests crackled with fire. Ocean streams began to boil, while the vapor encircled the titans, and the incessant, dazzling flashes bereft their eyes of sight, gods as they were. Fearful heat spread everywhere, and it seemed as if earth and heaven were clashing together and falling into ruins. At the same time, the wind spread abroad smoke and battle cry and crash of missiles, as the hundred-handed, insatiable in war, advanced, hurling three hundred vast rocks at a time against the enemy. Before this combination of terrors, even the titans could not stand. They were dashed from their battlements and fell like shooting stars nine days and nights to earth, 
and then on down for nine days and nights more to Tartarus. Here were they bound and cast into that dismal abyss, behind a triple brazen wall built by Poseidon, around which night is poured in three rows, and the hundred-handed were set to guard them. Kronos and a few others escaped to the north, and there made head for a time, sheltered against Zeus's thunderbolts in caverns of the hills. But there came to the Olympians two mighty twin shapes, force and might, followed by their sister, beauteous ankled Victory, from whose shoulders waved great eagle's wings, all children of Styx, and those two illustrious ones announced to Zeus that henceforth they were his servants, and that their sister Victory would ever follow them. So with these ministers Zeus went forth once more, and the remainder of the Titans fled westward beyond the utmost limits of earth. But huge Atlas, brother of Prometheus, was overtaken, and him Zeus stationed on the very verge of the earth before the clear-voiced Hesperides, sentencing him to bear forever on his shoulders the weight of the vast sky. Having thus achieved the victory, Zeus gave to Hades dominion over the underworld, to Poseidon the sea, and took himself the realm of the Aether and the earth, rewarding all those who had assisted him, and especially honoring Styx, mother of force, might, and victory, so that henceforth the most sacred and inviolable oath for an immortal was to swear by Styx. Mother Earth was far from pleased at this outcome. Her imprisoned firstborn children had been released only to have her other beautiful titan sons and daughters take their places in Tartarus. In revenge, she brought forth a brood of giants to war with the young gods. These were huge and invincible creatures with ghastly faces and long, thick, matted hair hanging from their heads and chins. Instead of feet, they had scaly dragon's tails. Their birthplace was in Phlegra, or Pallene. The most redoubtable among them were Porphyrion and Alcyonius. The latter was immortal so long as he fought on the same part of the earth on which he was born, and he soon distinguished himself by carrying off the cattle of the sun and moon. With these and their brethren, Enceladus, Pallas, Clytius, Polybotes, Hippolytus, and others, were joined Otus and Ephialtes, children of Poseidon, who, says Homer, grew nine inches every month, and who, when they were only nine years old, had captured war god Mars himself and held him prisoner more than a year. Now the oracle revealed to the gods that the giants could be destroyed only in combat with a mortal. Gaia, Earth, had learned this, and sought by means of magic herbs to make her offspring invulnerable also to mortals. But Zeus anticipated her. He forbade the dawn, the moon, and the sun to shine, cut off the medicinal herbs with which Earth had plastered her offspring, and sent Athena to summon Heracles to take part in the combat. This savage group of giants then attacked the Olympians, hurling great masses of rock, tree trunks lashed together, and blazing brands against the sky. But the distance was too great for them to do much damage, so they tried to scale heaven itself. When their trees fastened together proved too short, Otus and Ephialtes set about another attempt. Upsetting Mount Osa, they began to roll it towards Mount Olympus, intending to pile the lofty peak of Pelion on that, and thus reach their enemies. Then Zeus rose in his majesty. With a thunderbolt he hurled the mountain back to its former place. The Olympians all dashed down, riding on the winds, and a mighty battle followed which lasted a whole day. Heracles drew his great death-dealing bow and slew Alcyoneus with an arrow, but as soon as he touched the earth he rose with renewed life and strength. Whereupon wise Athena counseled the hero to grasp the monster by the foot and drag him out of Pallene, his birthplace. He did so, and Alcyoneus died. At this, Porphyrian in hot rage hurled the island of Delos at Zeus and rushed upon Heracles and Hera. As the giant laid hold of the goddess's swathing veils, she cried out for help, and the thunderbolt of Zeus and Heracles' arrow smote Porphyrion simultaneously. As for the rest, Apollo shot out the left eye of Ephialtes, and Heracles the right. Dionysus killed Eurytes with his sacred wand, while Clytius was thrust through by Hecate or Hephaestus with glowing iron stone. Enceladus fled across the sea, but Athena seized a great triangle of rock and cast it upon him, and when trees and soil formed on this, it was called the Island of Sicily. As Virgil's wandering hero Aeneas sings, Here, while from Aetna's furnaces the flame bursts forth, Enceladus, tis said, doth lie, scorched by the lightning. As his wearied frame he shifts, Trinacria, trembling at the cry, moans through her shores, and smoke involves the sky. Athena, terrible in her battle wrath, next killed and flayed Pallas, and put his skin over her own body while the combat lasted. Whence comes her name of Pallas Athene. Polybates, chased by Poseidon over the sea, came to cause. 
Here the sea god tore off a piece of the island and buried him under it, where now is Nisiron. Hermes, concealed by the helmet of Hades, killed Hippolytus while Artemis slew Gratian. So the fates ended Agrius and Thune with brazen clubs. The rest Zeus crushed with thunderbolts, and Heracles finished with his deadly arrows. Then, in hot wrath, Earth brought forth the most terrific monster yet seen. Typhon was he called, the greatest of Earth's children, half man and half animal. He was human to the loins, and was so huge that he towered over the mountains while his head knocked against the stars. His outstretched arms reached from sunrise to sunset, and a hundred dragon heads shot from his shoulders. Instead of legs, he moved on vast, rustling, snaky coils. His whole body was feathered, bristly hair floated in the wind from his head and chin, and fire streamed from his eyes. Such a monster was Typhon. Hurling clusters of rocks up at heaven, he ran with hisses and screams, while a red mass of flame bubbled from his mouth. When the gods saw him charge on heaven, they fled to Egypt, where they wandered about in the shapes of animals, pursued by him. Zeus hurled thunderbolts as long as he was afar off. When he came nearer, the god's iron sickle made him flee, and Zeus pursued him to the Caucasus that towers over Syria. There he came up with him, covered with wounds, and joined in a hand-to-hand -hand grapple. But Typhon held him off, wrapping his snaky limbs around him, snatched away the sickle, and cutting out the sinews of the god's hands and feet, put him on his shoulders and carried him away across the sea to Cilicia. Here in a cavern he threw him down, put away the sinews wrapped in a bearskin, and set as a guard over the helpless god Delphine, a young she-dragon, half-human, half-animal. But cunning Hermes stole away the sinews and secretly replaced them in Zeus's wrists and ankles. Then Zeus gathered himself together, and his former powers came upon him, and he rose to his seat in heaven in a car drawn by winged horses. Again he hurled his thunderbolts upon Typhon and pursued the monstrous giant to Mount Nysa, where the fates outwitted the fugitive. For, persuaded by them that he would thereby get greater powers, he ate of the ephemeral poison fruits. Then the chase became more furious. They came to Thrace, where Typhon fought with whole peaks of the Hamas Mountains, and when these were hurled back on him by the Thunderer, his blood gushed out over them, so that these are called the Bloody Mountains to this day. And at last, as Typhon was compelled to flee across the Sicilian Sea, Zeus threw the towering mountain of Aetna on top of him, and buried him there forever. Here he lies still, turning and groaning at times, while fires blaze up from the hurled lightnings. After that, there was nobody in heaven, earth, or the underworld who dared dispute the supreme dominion of Zeus. End of chapter 1「The Legend of Don Juan Manuel」by Thomas Albon Henbear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Legend of Don Juan Manuel This Don Juan Manuel, senor, was a rich and worthy gentleman who had the bad vice of killing people. Every night at eleven o'clock, when the palace clock was striking, he went out from his magnificent house, as you know, senor, it still is standing in the street that had been named after him, all muffled in his cloak, and under it, his dagger in his hand. Then he would meet one in the dark street, and would ask him politely, What is the hour of the night? And that person, having heard the striking of the clock, would answer, It is eleven hours of the night. And Don Juan Manuel would say to him, Senor, you are fortunate above all men, because you know precisely the hour at which you die. Then he would thrust with his dagger, and then leave the dead gentleman lying on the street. He would come back again into his own home. And this bad vice of Don Juan Manuel, of killing people, went on, senor, for a great many years. Living with Don Juan Manuel was a nephew whom he loved dearly, Every night, they stopped together. Later, the nephew would go forth to see one or another of his friends, and still later, Don Juan Manuel would go forth to kill some man. One night, the nephew did not come home. Don Juan Manuel was uneasy because of his not coming, fearing for him. In the early morning, the city watch knocked at Don Juan Manuel's door, bringing there the dead body of his nephew with a wound in the heart of him that had killed him. And when they told where his body had been found, 
Don Juan Manuel knew that he himself, not knowing him in the darkness, had killed his own nephew, whom he so loved. Then Don Juan Manuel saw that he had been leaving a bad life, and he went to the father to whom he confessed and confessed all the killings that he had done. And then the father put a penance upon him, that at midnight he shall go alone to the streets until he was come to the chapel of La Aspiracion, a faces upon the Posela of Santo Domingo, Senor. And in those days, before it was a gallows, and that he shall kneel in front of that chapel, but neath the gallows, and that so kneeling, he should tell his rosary through. And Don Juan Manuel was pleased because so light a penance had been put upon him, and so soon to have peace again in his soul. But that night, at midnight, when he set forth to do his penance, no sooner was he come out from his own door than voices sounded in his ears, and near him was the terrible ringing of a little bell, and he knew that the voices of which troubled him were those of the ones whom he killed. And the voices sounded in his ears so woefully that the ringing of the little bell was so terrible that he could not have kept onward. Having gone a little way, his stomach was tormented by the fear that was upon him, and he came back again to his own home. Then the next day he told the father what has happened, and that he could not do that penance, and asked that another be put upon him. But the father denied him of any other penance, and, and bade him to do that which was set for him, or die in his sin and go forever in hell. Then Don Juan Manuel again tried to do his penance, and at that time got a half of the way to the chapel of the Inspiracion, and then again turned backward to his home because of those woeful voices and the terrible ringing of that little bell. And so again he asked that he be given another penance, and again it was denied to him. And again, getting to that night three quarters of the way to the chapel, he tried to do what he was bidden to do, but he could not do it because of the woeful voices and the terrible ringing of the little bell. Then went he for the last time to the father to beg for another penance, and for the last time it was denied to him, and for the last time he set forth from his house at midnight to go to the chapel of La Espiracion, in front of it, kneeling beneath the gallows, to tell his rosary through. And that night, senor, was the very worst night of all. The voices were so loud and so very woeful that he was weak and dread of him, and he shook with fear, and his stomach was tormented because of the terrible ringing of the little bell. But he pressed on. You see, senor, it was the only way to save his soul from blistering in hell through all eternity. And so he was come to the Placera de Santo Domingo, and there in front of the chapel of La Espiracion, beneath the gallows, he knelt down upon his knees and told his rosary through. And in the morning, Senor, all the city was astonished, and everybody from the Vicroy down to the Cajadores came running to the Placera de Santo Domingo. And where was a sight to see? And the sight was Don Juan Manuel, hanging dead on the gallows, where the angels themselves has hung him, senor, because of his sin. End of Legend of Don Juan Manuel by Thomas Albon Hanver Recorded by Gabriel Rodriguez A Book of Myths by Jean Lang This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Book of Myths Orpheus Orpheus with his lute made trees, and the mountain tops that freeze, bow themselves when he did sing, to his music plants and flowers, ever sprung as sun and showers, there had made a lasting spring. Everything that heard him play, even the billows of the sea, hung their heads and then lay by, in sweet music in such art. 
killing care and grief of heart, fall asleep or hearing die. Shakespeare. Are we not all lovers as Orpheus was, loving what is gone from us forever, and seeking it vainly in the solitudes and wilderness of the mind, and crying to Eurydice to come again? And are we not all foolish as Orpheus was, hoping by the agony of love and the ecstasy of will to win back Eurydice? And do we not all fail as Orpheus failed, because we forsake the way of the other world for the way of this world? Fiona MacLeod It is the custom nowadays for scientists and for other scholarly people to take hold of the old myths, to take them to pieces and to find some deep, hidden meaning in each part of the story. So you will find that some will tell you that Orpheus is the personification of the winds, which tear up trees as they course along, chanting their wild music, and the Eurydice is the morning with its short-lived beauty. Others say that Orpheus is the mythological expression of the delight which music gives to the primitive races, while yet others accept without hesitation the idea that Orpheus is the sun, that when day is done, plunges into the black abyss of night, in the vain hope of overtaking his lost bride, Eurydice, the rosy dawn. And whether they be right or wrong, it would seem that the sadness that comes to us sometimes as the day dies and the last of the sun's rays vanish to leave the hills and valleys dark and cold, the sorrowful feeling that we cannot understand when in country places we hear music coming from far away, or listen to the plaintive song of the bird, are things that very specially belong to the story of Orpheus. In the country of Thrace, surrounded by all the best gifts of the gods, Orpheus was born. His father was Apollo, the god of music and of song, and his mother the muse Calliope. Apollo gave his little son the lyre, and himself taught him how to play it. It was not long before all the wild things in the woods of Thrace crept out from the green trees and thick undergrowth, and from the holes and caves in the rocks, to listen to the music that the child's fingers made. The coo of the dove to his mate, the flute-clear trill of the blackbird, the song of the lark, the liquid carol of the nightingale, all ceased when the boy made music. The winds that whispered their secrets to the trees owned him for their lord, and the proudest trees of the forest bowed their heads that they might not miss one exquisite sigh that his fingers drew from the magical strings. No man nor beast lived in his day that could not sway by the power of his melody. He played a lullaby, and all things slept. He played a love lilt, and the flowers sprang up in full bloom from the cold earth, and the dreaming red rosebud opened wide her velvet petals, and all the land seemed full of the loving echoes of the lilt he played. He played a war march, and afar off the sleeping tyrants of the forest sprang up, wide awake, and bared their angry teeth. And the untried youths of Thrace ran to beg their fathers to let them taste battle, while the scarred warriors felt on their thumbs the sharpness of their sword blades and smiled, well content. While he played it would seem as though the very stones and rocks gained hearts. Nay, the whole heart of the universe became one great, palpitating, beautiful thing, an instrument from whose trembling strings was drawn out the music of Orpheus. He rose to great power and became a mighty prince of Thrace, not as a lute alone, but he himself played on the hearts of the fair Eurydice and held it captive. It seemed as though, when they became man and wife, all happiness must be theirs. But although Hymen, the god of marriage, himself came to bless them on the day they wed, the omens on that day were against them. The torch that Hymen carried had no golden flame, but sent out pungent black smoke that made their eyes water. They feared they knew not what. But when, soon afterwards, as Eurydice wandered with the nymphs, her companions, through the blue-shadowed woods of Thrace, the reason was discovered. A bold shepherd, who did not know her for a princess, saw Eurydice, and no sooner saw her than he loved her. He ran after her to proclaim to her his love, and she, afraid of his wild uncouthness, fled before him. She ran in her terror too swiftly to watch whither she went, and a poisonous snake that lurked among the fern bit the fair white foot that flitted like a butterfly across it. In agonized suffering, Eurydice died. Her spirit went to the land of the shades, and Orpheus was left broken-hearted. The sad winds that blow at night across the sea, the sobbing gales that tell of wreck and death, the birds that wail in the darkness for their mates, the sad soft whisper of the aspen leaves and the leaves of the heavy-clad blue-black cypresses, all now were hushed, for greater than all, more full of bitter sorrow than any, rose the music of Orpheus, 
a long-drawn sob from a broken heart in the valley of the shadow of death. Grief came alike to gods and to men as they listened, but no comfort came to him from the expression of his sorrow. At length, when to bear his grief longer was impossible for him, Orpheus wandered to Olympus, and there besought Zeus to give him permission to seek his wife in the gloomy land of the shades. Zeus, moved by his anguish, granted the permission he sought, but solemnly warned him of the terrible perils of his undertaking. But the love of Orpheus was too perfect to know any fear. Thankfully, he hastened to the dark cave on the side of the promontory of Tenaris, and soon arrived at the entrance of Hades. Stark and grim was the three-headed watchdog Cerberus, which guarded the door, and with the growls and the furious roaring of a wild beast athirst for its prey, it greeted Orpheus. But Orpheus touched his lute, and the brute, amazed, sank into silence. And still he played, and the dog would gently have licked the player's feet, and looked up in his face with its savage eyes full of the light that we see in the eyes of the dogs on this earth, as they gaze with love at their masters. On then strode Orpheus, playing still, and the melody he drew from his lute passed before him into the realms of Pluto. Surely never were heard such strains. They told of perfect, tender love, of unending longing, of pain too great to end with death. Of all the beauties of the earth they sang, of the sorrow of the world, of all the world's desire, of things past, of things to come. And ever, through the song that the lute sang, there came, like a thread of silver that is woven in the black velvet pall, a limpid melody. It was as though a bird sang in the murk night, and it spoke of peace and of hope and of joy that knows no ending. Into the blackest depths of Hades the sounds sped on their way, and the hands of time stood still. From his bitter task of trying to quaff the stream that ever receded from the parched and burning lips, Tantalus ceased for a moment. The ceaseless course of Ixion's wheel was stayed. The vulture's relentless beak no longer tore the titan's liver. Sisyphus gave up his weary task of rolling the stone and sat on the rock to listen. Naiads rested from their labor of drawing water in a sieve. For the first time, the cheeks of the Furies were wet with tears, and the restless shades that came and went in the darkness, like dead autumn leaves driven by a winter gale, stood still to gaze and listen. Before the throne where Pluto and his queen Persephone were seated, sable-clad and stern, the relentless fates at their feet, Orpheus still played on and to Persephone then came the living remembrance of all the joys of her girlhood by the blue Aegean Sea in the fair island of Sicily. Again she knew the fragrance and the beauty of the flowers of spring. Even into Hades the scent of the violets seemed to come, and afresh in her heart was the sorrow that had been hers on the day on which the ruthless king of darkness tore her from her mother and from all that she held most dear. Silent she sat beside her frowning, stern-faced lord, but her eyes grew dim. When, with a quivering sigh, the music stopped, Orpheus fearlessly pled his cause. To let him have Eurydice, to give him back his more than life, to grant that he might lead her with him up to the light of heaven, that was his prayer. The eyes of Pluto and Persephone did not dare to meet, yet with one accord was their answer given. Eurydice should be given back to him, but only on one condition. Not until he had reached the light of earth again was he to turn round and look upon the face, for a sight of which his eyes were tired with longing. Eagerly Orpheus complied, and with a heart almost breaking with gladness he heard the call for Eurydice and turned to retrace his way, with the light footfall of the little feet that he adored making music behind him. Too good a thing, it seemed, too unbelievable a joy. She was there, quite close to him. Their days of happiness were not ended. His love had won her back, even from the land of darkness. All that he had not told her of that love, yet, while she was on earth, he would tell her now. All that he had failed in before, he would make perfect now. The little limping foot, how it made his soul overflow with adoring tenderness. So near she was, he might even touch her were he to stretch back his hand. And then there came to him a hideous doubt. What if Pluto had played him false? What if here followed him not Eurydice, but a mocking shade? As he climbed the steep ascent that led upward to the light, his fear grew more cruelly real. Almost he could imagine that her footsteps had stopped, that when he reached the light he would find himself left once more to his cruel loneliness. Too overwhelming for him was the doubt. So nearly there they were that the darkness was no longer that of night, but as that of evening when the long shadows fall upon the land, and there seemed no reason for Orpheus to wait. Swiftly he turned and found his wife behind him, 
but only for a moment she stayed. Her arms were thrown open, and Orpheus would fain have grasped her in his own. Before they could touch each other, Eurydice was borne from him back into the darkness. "'Farewell,' she said. "'Farewell,' and her voice was a sigh of hopeless grief. In mad desperation, Orpheus sought to follow her, but his attempt was in vain. At the brink of the dark, fierce flooded Asheron, the boat with its boatman, old Charon, lay ready to ferry across to the further shore those whose future lay in the land of shades. To him ran Orpheus in clamorous anxiety to undo the evil he had wrought, but Charon angrily repulsed him. There was no place for such as Orpheus in his ferry boat. Those only who went, never to return, could find a passage there. For seven long days and seven longer nights, Orpheus waited beside the river, hoping that Charon would relent, but at last hope died, and he sought the depths of the forests of Thrace, where trees and rocks and beasts and birds were all his friends. He took his lyre again and played. Such strains as would have won the ear of Pluto to have quite set free his half-regained Eurydice, Milton. Day and night he stayed in the shadows of the woodlands, all the sorrow of his heart expressing itself in the song of his lute. The fiercest beasts of the forest crawled to his feet and looked up at him with eyes full of pity. The song of the birds ceased, and when the wind moaned through the trees, they echoed his cry, Eurydice, Eurydice. In the dawning hours, it would seem to him that he saw her again, flitting, a thing of mist and rising sun, across the dimness of the woods. And when evening came and all things rested, and the night called out to the mystery of the forest, again he would see her. In the long blue shadows of the trees she would stand, up the woodland paths she walked, where her little feet fluttered the dry leaves as she passed. Her face was as white as lily in the moonlight, and ever she held out her arms to Orpheus. At that elm vista's end I trace, dimly thy sad leaving taking face, Eurydice, Eurydice. The tremulous leaves repeat to me, Eurydice, Eurydice, Lowell. For Orpheus, it was a good day when Jason, chief of the Argonauts, sought him out to bid him come with the other heroes and aid in the quest of the Golden Fleece. Have I not had enough of toil and weary wandering far and wide, sighed Orpheus. In vain is the skill of the voice which my goddess mother gave me. In vain have I sung and labored. In vain I went down to the dead and charmed all the kings of Hades, to win back Eurydice, my bride, for I won her, my beloved, and lost her again the same day, and wandered away in the madness, even to Egypt and the Libyan sands, and the isles of all the seas. I charmed in vain the hearts of men, and the savage forest beasts, and the trees, and the lifeless stones, with my magic harp and song, giving rest, but finding none. But in the good ship Argo, Orpheus took his place with the others, and sailed the watery ways, and the songs that Orpheus sang to his shipmates, and that tell of all their great adventures are called the Songs of Orpheus, or the Orphix, to this day. Many were the mishaps and disasters that his music warded off. With it he lulled monsters to sleep, more powerful to work magic on the hearts of men were his melodies than were the songs of the sirens when they tried to capture the Argonauts by their wiles, and in their downward destroying rush his music checked mountains. When the quest of the Argonauts was ended, Orpheus returned to his own land of Thrace. As a hero he had fought and endured hardship, but his wounded soul remained unhealed. Again the trees listened to the songs of longing. Again they echoed Eurydice, Eurydice. As he sat one day near a river in the stillness of the forest, there came from afar an ugly clamor of sound. It struck against the music of Orpheus' lute and slew it, as the coarse cries of the screaming gulls that fight for carrion slay the song of a soaring lark. It was the day of the feast of Bacchus, and through the woods poured Bacchus and his Bacchanites. A shameless rout, satyrs capering around them, centaurs neighing aloud. Long had the Bacchanites hated the loyal poet-lover of one fair woman whose dwelling was the shades. His ears were ever deaf to their passionate voices, his eyes blind to their passionate loveliness, as they danced to the green trees, a riot of color, of fierce beauty, of laughter and of mad song. Mad they were indeed this day, and in their madness the very existence of Orpheus was a thing not to be born. At first they stoned him, but his music made the stones fall harmless at his feet. Then in a frenzy of cruelty, with the maniac lust to cause blood to flow, to know the joy of taking life, they threw themselves upon Orpheus and did him to death. From limb to limb they tore him, casting at last his head and his blood-stained lyre into the river. And still, as the water bore him on, the lyre murmured its last music, and the white lips of Orpheus still breathed of her whom at last he had gone to join in the shadowy land, Eurydice. Eurydice. 
combien d'autres sont mortes de même. Cette la lutte et la force brutale contre l'intelligence douce et sublime inspirée du ciel, dont le royaume n'est pas de ce monde. In the heavens, as a bright constellation called Lyra or Orpheus, the gods placed his lute, and to the place of his martyrdom came the muses, and with loving care carried the fragments of the massacred body to Libet Lyra at the foot of Mount Olympus, and there buried them. And there unto this day, more sweetly than at any other spot in any other land, the nightingale sings. For it sings of a love that knows no ending, of life after death, of a love so strong that it can conquer even death, the all-powerful. End of Orpheus, A Book of Myths, by Jean Lay. K. Cavus by Fedosi. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. K. Cavus When K. Cavus ascended the throne of his father, the whole world was obedient to his will, but he soon began to deviate from the wise customs and rules which had been recommended as essential to his prosperity and happiness. He feasted and drank wine continually with his warriors and chiefs, so that in the midst of his luxurious enjoyments he looked upon himself as superior to every being upon the face of the earth, and thus astonished the people, high and low, by his extravagance and pride. One day a demon, disguised as a musician, waited upon the monarch, and playing sweetly on his harp, sung a song in praise of Mazanderan, and thus he warbled to the king. Mazanderan is the bower of spring, my native home. The balmy air diffuses health and fragrance there. So tempered is the genial glow, nor heat nor cold we ever know. Tulips and hyacinths abound on every lawn, and all around blooms like a garden in its prime, fostered by that delicious clime. The bulbul sits on every spray, and pours his soft, melodious lay. Each rural spot its sweets discloses, each streamlet is the dew of roses, and damsels, idols of the heart, sustain a more bewitching part. And mark me, that untravelled man, who never saw Marzenderan, and all the charms its bowers possess, has never tasted happiness. No sooner had Kekavus heard this description of the country of Mazanderan than he determined to lead an army thither, declaring to his warriors that the splendour and glory of his reign should exceed that of either Jamshid, Zahak, or Kegobad. The warriors, however, were alarmed at this precipitate resolution, thinking it certain destruction to make war against the demons, but they had not courage or confidence enough to disclose their real sentiments. They only ventured to suggest that if his majesty reflected a little on the subject, he might not ultimately consider the enterprise so advisable as he had at first imagined. But this produced no impression, and then they deemed it expedient to dispatch a messenger to Zal to inform him of the wild notions which the evil one had put into the head of K. Kavus to effect his ruin, imploring Zal to allow of no delay, otherwise the eminent services so lately performed by him and Rostam for the state would be rendered utterly useless and vain. Upon this summons, Zal immediately set off from Sistan to Iran, and having arrived at the royal court, and been received with customary respect and consideration, he endeavoured to dissuade the king from the contemplated expedition into Mazanderan. Oh, could I wash the darkness from thy mind, and show thee all the perils that surround this undertaking! Jamshid, high in power, whose diadem was brilliant as the sun, who ruled the demons, never in his pride dreamt of the conquest of Mazanderan. Remember Feridun, he overthrew Zahak, 
destroyed the tyrant, but he never thought of the conquest of Mazanderan. This strange ambition never fired the souls of bygone monarchs. Mighty Manuchair, always victorious, boundless in his wealth. Nor Zhao, nor Nozar, nor even Kegobad, with all their pomp and all their grandeur, ever dreamt of the conquest of Mazanderan. It is the place of demon sorceress, and all enchanted. Swords are useless there. No bribery nor wisdom can obtain possession of that charm-infested land. Then throw not men and treasure to the winds. Waste not the precious blood of warriors brave in trying to subdue Mazanderan. K. Kavus, however, was not one to be diverted from his purpose, and with respect to what his predecessors had not done, he considered himself superior in might and influence to either Feridun, Jamshid, Manusher, or K. Gobad, who had never aspired to the conquest of Mazanderan. He further observed that he had a bolder heart, a larger army, and a fuller treasury than any of them, and the whole world was under his sway. And what are all these demon charms, that they excite such dread alarms? What is a demon host to me, their magic spells and sorcery? One effort, and the field is won. Then why should I the battle shun? Be thou and Rostam, whilst afar I wage the soul-appalling war, the guardians of the kingdom. Heaven to me hath its protection given, and, when I reach the demon's fort, their severed heads shall be my sport. When Zal became convinced of the unalterable resolution of K. Kavus, he ceased to oppose his views, and expressed his readiness to comply with whatever commands he might receive for the safety of the state. May all thy actions prosper! Mayst thou never have cause to recollect my warning voice with sorrow or repentance! Heaven protect thee! Zal then took leave of the king and his warrior friends, and returned to Sistan, not without melancholy forebodings respecting the issue of the war against Marzanderan. As soon as morning dawned, the army was put in motion. The charge of the empire and the keys of the treasury and jewel chamber were left in the hands of Milad, with injunctions, however, not to draw a sword against any enemy that might spring up without the consent and assistance of Zal and Rustam. When the army had arrived within the limits of Marzandaran, Kavus ordered Give to select two thousand of the bravest men, the boldest wielders of the battle-axe, and proceed rapidly towards the city. In his progress, according to the king's instructions, he burnt and destroyed everything of value, mercilessly slaying man, woman, and child. For the king said, Kill all before thee, whether young or old, and turn their day to night. Thus free the world from the magician's art. Proceeding in his career of desolation and ruin, Give came near to the city, and found it arrayed in all the splendour of heaven. Every street was crowded with beautiful women, richly adorned, and young damsels with faces as bright as the moon. The treasure chamber was full of gold and jewels, and the country abounded with cattle. Information of this discovery was immediately sent to Kavus, who was delighted to find that Mazandaran was truly a blessed region, the very garden of beauty where the cheeks of the women seemed to be tinted with the hue of the pomegranate flower by the gatekeeper of paradise. This invasion filled the heart of the king of Mazanderan with grief and alarm, and his first care was to call the gigantic white demon to his aid. Meanwhile, K. Kavus, full of the wildest anticipations of victory, was encamped on the plain near the city in splendid state, and preparing to commence the final overthrow of the enemy on the following day. In the night, however, a cloud came, and deep darkness like pitch overspread the earth, and tremendous hailstones poured down upon the Persian host, throwing them into the greatest confusion. Thousands were destroyed, others fled, and were scattered abroad in the gloom. The morning dawned, 
but it brought no light to the eyes of Kay Kavus, and amidst the horrors he experienced, his treasury was captured, and the soldiers of his army either killed or made prisoners of war. Then did he bitterly lament that he had not followed the wise counsel of Zal. Seven days he was involved in this dreadful affliction, and on the eighth day he heard the roar of the white demon, saying, O king, thou art the willow tree, all barren, with neither fruit nor flower. What could induce the dream of conquering Marzandaran? Hadst thou no friend to warn thee of thy folly? Hadst thou not heard of the white demon's power, of him who from the gorgeous vault of heaven can charm the stars? From this mad enterprise others have wisely shrunk. And what hast thou accomplished by a more ambitious course? Thy soldiers have slain many. Dire destruction and spoil have been their purpose. Thy wild will has promptly been obeyed. But thou art now without an army. Not one man remains to lift a sword or stand in thy defence. No one to hear thy groans and thy despair. There were selected from the army twelve thousand of the demon warriors to take charge of and hold in custody the Iranian captives, all the chiefs as well as the soldiers, being secured with bonds, and only allowed food enough to keep them alive. Arjang, one of the demon leaders, having got possession of the wealth, the crown, and the jewels belonging to Kay Kavus, was appointed to escort the captive king and his troops, all of whom were deprived of sight, to the city of Mazandaran, where they were delivered into the hands of the monarch of that country. The white demon, after thus putting an end to hostilities, returned to his own abode. Kay Kavus, strictly guarded as he was, found an opportunity of sending an account of his blind and helpless condition to Zal, in which he lamented that he had not followed his advice, and urgently requested him, if he was not himself in confinement, to come to his assistance and release him from captivity. When Zal heard the melancholy story, he gnawed the very skin of his body with vexation, and turning to Rostam, conferred with him in private. The sword must be unsheathed, since Kay Kavus is bound a captive in the dragon's den, and Raksh must be saddled for the field, and thou must bear the weight of this emprise, for I have lived two centuries, and old age unfits me for the heavy toils of war. Shouldst thou release the king, thy name will be exalted over the earth. Then don thy mail, and gain immortal honour. Rostam replied that it was a long journey to Mazandaran, and that the king had been six months on the road. Upon this, Zal observed that there were two roads. The most tedious one was that which Kay Kavus had taken, but by the other, which was full of dangers and difficulty, and lions and demons and sorcery, he might reach Mazandaran in seven days, if he reached it at all. On hearing these words, Rostam assented, and chose the short road, observing, Although it is not wise, they say, with willing feet to track the way to hell, though only men who have lost all love of life, by misery crossed, would rush into the tiger's lair and die, poor reckless victims there. I gird my loins, whatever may be, and trust in God for victory. On the following day, resigning himself to the protection of heaven, he put on his war attire, and with his favourite horse, Raksh, properly caprisoned, stood prepared for the journey. His mother, Rudave, took leave of him with great sorrow, and the young hero departed from Sistan, consoling himself and his friends thus. Over him who seeks the battlefield, nobly his prisoned king to free, heaven will extend its saving shield, and crown his arms with victory. End of K. Kavus by Fedosi The Seven Labours of Rostam by Fedosi This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seven Labours of Rostam 
First stage. He rapidly pursued his way, performing two days' journey in one, and soon came to a forest full of wild asses. Oppressed with hunger, he succeeded in securing one of them, which he roasted over a fire, lighted by sparks produced by striking the point of his spear and kept in a blaze with dried grass and branches of trees. After regaling himself and satisfying his hunger, he loosened the bridle of Raksh and allowed him to graze, and, choosing a safe place for repose during the night, and taking care to have his sword under his head, he went to sleep among the reeds of that wilderness. In a short space, a fierce lion appeared, and attacked Raksh with great violence, but Raksh very speedily with his teeth and heels put an end to his furious assailant. Rustam, awakened by the confusion, and seeing the dead lion before him, said to his favourite companion, Ah, oh, Raksh! Why so thoughtless groan to fight a lion thus alone? For had it been thy fate to bleed, and not thy foe, my gallant steed, how could thy master have conveyed his helm, and battle-axe, and blade, command, and bow, and barbarian, unaided to Mazandaran? Why didst thou fail to give the alarm, and save thyself from chance of harm, by neighing loudly in my ear? But though thy bold heart knows no fear, from such unwise exploits refrain, nor try a lion's strength again. Saying this, Rostam laid down to sleep, and did not awake till the morning dawned. As the sun rose, he remounted Raksh, and proceeded on his journey towards Mazandaran. Second Stage After travelling rapidly for some time, he entered a desert in which no water was to be found, and the sand was so burning hot that it seemed to be instinct with fire. Both horse and rider were oppressed with the most maddening thirst. Rostam alighted, and vainly wandered about in search of relief, till almost exhausted, he put up a prayer to heaven for protection against the evils which surrounded him, engaged as he was in an enterprise for the release of Kay Kavus and the Persian army, then in the power of the demons. With pious earnestness, he besought the Almighty to bless him in the great work, and whilst in a despairing mood he was lamenting his deplorable condition, his tongue and throat being parched with thirst, his body prostrate on the sand, under the influence of a raging sun. He saw a sheep pass by, which he hailed as the harbinger of good. Rising up and grasping his sword in his hand, he followed the animal, and came to a fountain of water, where he devoutly returned thanks to God for the blessing which had preserved his existence, and prevented the wolves from feeding on his lifeless limbs. Refreshed by the cool water, he then looked out for something to allay his hunger, and killing a gour, he lighted a fire and roasted it, and regaled upon its savoury flesh, which he eagerly tore from the bones. When the period of rest arrived, Rostam addressed Raksh, and said to him angrily, Beware, my steed, of future strife. Again thou must not risk thy life. Encounter not with lion fell, nor demon still more terrible. But should an enemy appear, ring loud the warning in my ear. After delivering these injunctions, Rostam laid down to sleep, leaving Raksh unbridled, and at liberty to crop the herbage close by. Third Stage at midnight, a monstrous dragon serpent issued from the forest. It was eighty yards in length, and so fierce that neither elephant, nor demon, nor lion ever ventured to pass by its lair. It came forth, and seeing the champion asleep and a horse near him, the latter was the first object of attack. But Raksh retired towards his master, and neighed and beat the ground so furiously that Rostam soon awoke, looking around on every side. However, he saw nothing. The dragon had vanished, and he went to sleep again. Again, the dragon burst out of the thick darkness, 
and again Raksh was at the pillow of his master, who rose up at the alarm, but anxiously trying to penetrate the dreary gloom, he saw nothing. All was a blank, and annoyed at this apparently vexatious conduct of his horse, he spoke sharply. Why thus again disturb my rest, when sleep had softly soothed my breast? I told thee, if thou chance to see another dangerous enemy, to sound the alarm, but not to keep depriving me of needful sleep, when nothing meets the eye nor ear, nothing to cause a moment's fear. But if again my rest is broke, on thee shall fall the fatal stroke, and I myself will drag this load of ponderous arms along the road. Yes, I will go, a lonely man, without thee, to Mazandaran. Rostam again went to sleep, and Raksh was resolved this time not to move a step from his side, for his heart was grieved and afflicted by the harsh words that had been addressed to him. The dragon again appeared, and the faithful horse almost tore up the earth with his heels to rouse his sleeping master. Rostam again awoke and sprang to his feet, and was again angry, but, fortunately, at that moment, sufficient light was providentially given for him to see the prodigious cause of alarm. Then, swift, he drew his sword, and closed in strife with that huge monster. Dreadful was the shock, and perilous to Rostam. But, when Raksh perceived the contest doubtful, furiously, with his keen teeth, he bit and tore away the dragon's scaly hide, whilst quickly as thought, the champion severed off the ghastly head, and deluged all the plain with horrid blood. Amazed to see a form so hideous, breathless, stretched out before him, he returned thanks to the Omnipotent for his success, saying, Upheld by thy protecting arm, what is a lion's strength, a demon's rage, or all the horrors of the burning desert, with not one drop to quench devouring thirst? Nothing, since power and might Proceed from thee. Fourth Stage Rostam, having resumed the saddle, continued his journey through an enchanted territory, and in the evening came to a beautifully green spot, refreshed by flowing rivulets, where he found, to his surprise, a ready-roasted deer and some bread and salt. He alighted and sat down near the enchanted provisions, which vanished at the sound of his voice, and presently a tambourine met his eyes and a flask of wine. Taking up the instrument, he played upon it, and chanted a ditty about his own wanderings and the exploits which he most loved. He said that he had no pleasure in banquets, but only in the field, fighting with heroes and crocodiles in war. The song happened to reach the ears of a sorceress, who, arrayed in all the charms of beauty, suddenly approached him and sat down by his side. The champion put up a prayer of gratitude for having been supplied with food and wine and music in the desert of Mazandaran, and not knowing that the enchantress was a demon in disguise, he placed in her hands a cup of wine in the name of God. But at the mention of the Creator, the enchanted form was converted into a black fiend. Seeing this, Rostam threw his command, and secured the demon, and, drawing his sword, at once cut the body in two. Fifth Stage From thence, proceeding onward, he approached a region destitute of light, a void of utter darkness. Neither moon nor star peeped through the gloom. No choice of path remained, and therefore, throwing loose the rein, he gave Raksh the power to travel on, unguided. At length the darkness was dispersed, the earth became a scene, joyous and light and gay, covered with waving corn. There Rostam paused, and quitting his good steed among the grass, laid himself gently down, and, wearied, slept, his shield beneath his head his sword before him. 
When the keeper of the forest saw the stranger and his horse, he went to Rostam, then asleep, and struck his staff violently on the ground. And having thus awakened the hero, he asked him, devil that he was, why he had allowed his horse to feed upon the green cornfield. Angry at these words, Rostam, without uttering a syllable, seized hold of the keeper by the ears and wrung them off. The mutilated wretch, gathering up his severed ears, hurried away, covered with blood, to his master, Olad, and told him of the injury he had sustained from a man like a black demon, with a tiger-skin cuirass and an iron helmet, showing at the same time the bleeding witnesses of his sufferings. Upon being informed of this outrageous proceeding, Olad, burning with wrath, summoned together his fighting men, and hastened by the directions of the keeper to the place where Rostam had been found asleep. The champion received the angry lord of the land, fully prepared on horseback, and heard him demand his name, that he might not slay a worthless antagonist, and why he had torn off the ears of his forest keeper. Rostam replied that the very sound of his name would make him shudder with horror. Orlad then ordered his troops to attack Rostam, and they rushed upon him with great fury, but their leader was presently killed by the master hand, and great numbers were also scattered lifeless over the plain. The survivors running away, Rostam's next object was to follow and secure, by his command, the person of Orlad, and with admirable address and ingenuity he succeeded in dismounting him and taking him alive. He then bound his hands and said to him, if thou wilt speak the truth unmixed with lies, unmixed with false, prevaricating words, and faithfully point out to me the caves of the white demon and his warrior chiefs, and where Kavus is prisoned, thy reward shall be the kingdom of Mazandran, for I myself will place thee on that throne. But if thou playest me false, thy worthless blood shall answer for the foul deception. Stay, be not in wrath. Orlad at once replied, Thy wish shall be fulfilled, and thou shalt know where King Kavus is prisoned, and beside where the white demon reigns, between two dark and lofty mountains, in two hundred caves, immeasurably deep, his people dwell. Twelve hundred demons keep watch by night, and Bede and Sinjong, like a reed, the hills tremble whenever the white demon moves, but dangerous is the way. A stony desert lies full before thee, which the nimble deer has never passed. Then a prodigious stream, too far sanguide, obstructs thy path, whose banks are covered with a host of warrior demons guarding the passage to Mazanderon. And thou art but a single man, canst thou overcome such fearful obstacles as these? At this the champion smiled. Show but the way and thou shalt see what one man can perform with power derived from God. Lead on with speed to royal Kavus. With obedient haste, Orlad proceeded, Rostam following fast, mounted on Raksh. Neither dismal night nor joyous day they rested. On they went, until at length they reached the fatal field, where Kavus was overcome. At midnight hour, Whilst watching with attentive eye and ear, a piercing clamour echoed all around, and blazing fires were seen, and numerous lamps burnt bright on every side. Rostam inquired what this might be. It is Mazandaran, Olad rejoined, and the white demon chiefs are gathered there. Then Rostam to a tree bound his obedient guide to keep him safe and to recruit his strength, laid down a while and soundly slept. When morning dawned, he rose, and mounting Raksh, put his helmet on, the tiger's skin defended his broad chest, and sallying forth, he sought the demon chief Arjang, and summoned him with such a roar that stream and mountain shook. Arjang sprang up, hearing a human voice, and from his tent in indignant issued. Him and the champion met, and clutched his arms and ears, and from his body 
tore off the gory head and cast it far amidst the shuddering demons, who with fear shrunk back and fled, precipitate, lest they should likewise feel that dreadful punishment. Sixth Stage After this achievement, Rostam returned to the place where he had left Orlard, and having released him, sat down under the tree and related what he had done. He then commanded his guide to show the way to the place where Kay Gavus was confined, and when the champion entered the city of Mazandaran, the neighing of Raksh was so loud that the sound distinctly reached the ears of the captive monarch. Kavus rejoiced and said to his people, I have heard the voice of Raksh, and my misfortunes are at an end. But they thought he was either insane or telling them a dream. The actual appearance of Rostam, however, soon satisfied them. Gudars and Tus and Bahram and Giv and Gostaham were delighted to meet him, and the king embraced him with great warmth and affection, and heard from him with admiration the story of his wonderful progress and exploits. But Kavus and his warriors, under the influence and spells of the demons, were still blind, and he cautioned Rostam particularly to conceal Raksh from the sight of the sorcerers, for if the white demon should hear of the slaughter of Ar Zhang and the conqueror being at Mazandaran, he would immediately assemble an overpowering army of demons, and the consequences might be terrible. But thou must storm the cavern of the demons and the gigantic chief. Great need there is for sword and battle axe, and with the aid of heaven, these miscreant sorcerers may fall victims to thy avenging might. The road is straight to thee. Reach the seven mountains, and there thou wilt discern the various groups which guard the awful passages. Further on, within a deep and horrible recess, frowns the white demon. Conquer him! Destroy that fell magician, and restore to sight thy suffering king and all his warrior train. The wise in cures declare that the warm blood from the white demon's heart, dropped in the eye, removes all blindness. It is then my hope, favoured by God, that thou wilt slay the fiend, and save us from the misery we endure, the misery of darkness without end. Rostam, accordingly, after having warned his friends and companions in arms to keep on the alert, prepared for the enterprise, and guided by Orlad, hurried on till he came to the Haft Kuf, or Seven Mountains. There he found numerous companies of demons, and, coming to one of the caverns, saw it crowded with the same awful beings. And now, consulting with Orlad, he was informed that the most advantageous time for attack would be when the sun became hot, for then all the demons were accustomed to go to sleep, with the exception of a very small number who were appointed to keep watch. He therefore waited till the sun rose high in the firmament, and as soon as he had bound Olad to a tree hand and foot with the thongs of his command, drew his sword and rushed among the prostrate demons, dismembering and slaying all that fell in his way. Dreadful was the carnage, and those who survived fled in the wildest terror from the champion's fury. Seventh Stage Rostam now hastened forward to encounter the white demon. Advancing to the cavern, he looked down and saw a gloomy place, dismal as hell, but not one cursed impious sorcerer was visible in that infernal depth. A while he stood, his falchion in his grasp, and rubbed his eyes to sharpen his dim sight, and then a mountain form, covered with hair, filling up all the space, rose into view. The monster was asleep, but presently the daring shouts of Rostam broke his rest and brought him suddenly upon his feet. When seizing a huge millstone, forth he came, and thus accosted the intruding chief. Art thou so tired of life, that reckless thus thou dost invade the precincts of the demons? Tell me thy name, 
that I may not destroy a nameless thing. The champion, Stern, replied. My name is Rostam, sent by Zal, my father, descended from the champion, Sam Sovar, to be revenged on thee. The king of Persia being now a prisoner in Razandaran. When the accursed demon heard the name of Sam Sovar, he, like a serpent, writhed in agony of spirit, terrified at that announcement. Then, recovering strength, he forward sprang and hurled the millstone huge against his adversary, who fell back and disappointed the prodigious blow. Black frowned the demon, and through Rostam's heart a wild sensation ran of dire alarm. But, rousing up, his courage was revived, and wielding furiously his beaming sword, he pierced the demon's thigh and lopped the limb. Then both together grappled, and the cavern shook with the contest. Each at times prevailed. The flesh of both was torn, and streaming blood crimsoned the earth. If I survive this day, said Rostam in his heart, in that dread strife, my life must be immortal. The white demon, with equal terror, muttered to himself, I know despair of life, sweet life, no more shall I be welcomed at Mazandaran. And still they struggled hard, still sweat and blood poured down at every strain. Rostam, at last, gathering fresh power, vouchsafed by favouring heaven, and bringing all his mighty strength to bear, raised up the gasping demon in his arms, and with such fury dashed him to the ground that life no longer moved his monstrous frame. Promptly he then tore out the reeking heart, and crowds of demons simultaneous fell as part of him, and stained the earth with gore. Others, who saw the signal overthrow, trembled and hurried from the scene of blood. Then the great victor, issuing from that cave with pious haste, took off his helm and mail and royal girdle, and with water washed his face and body, choosing a pure place for prayer, to praise his Maker, him who gave the victory, the eternal source of good, without whose grace and blessing what is man? With it his armour is impregnable. The champion, having finished his prayer, resumed his war habiliments, and, going to Orlad, released him from the tree and gave into his charge the heart of the white demon. He then pursued his journey back to Kavus at Mazandaran. On the way, Orlad solicited some reward for the services he had performed, and Rostam again promised that he should be appointed governor of the country. But first the monarch of Mazandaran, the demon king, must be subdued, cast into the yawning cavern, and his legions of foul enchanters utterly destroyed. Upon his arrival at Mazandaran, Rostam related to his sovereign all that he had accomplished, and especially that he had torn out and brought away the white demon's heart, the blood of which was destined to restore Kay Kavus and his warriors to sight. Rostam was not long in applying the miraculous remedy, and the moment the blood touched their eyes, the fearful blindness was perfectly cured. The champion brought the demon's heart, and squeezed the blood from every part, which, dropped upon the injured sight, made all things visible and bright. One moment broke that magic gloom, which seemed more dreadful than the tomb. The monarch immediately ascended his throne, surrounded by all his warriors, and seven days were spent in mutual congratulations and rejoicing. On the eighth day, they all resumed the saddle, and proceeded to contemplate the destruction of the enemy. They set fire to the city, and burnt it to the ground, and committed such horrid carnage among the remaining magicians that streams of loathsome blood crimsoned all the place. Kavus afterwards sent Farhad as an ambassador to the king of Mazandaran, suggesting to him the expediency of submission, 
and representing to him the terrible fall of Arjang, and of the white demon, with all his host, as a warning against resistance to the valour of Rostam. But when the king of Mazandaran heard from Farhad the purpose of his embassy, he expressed great astonishment, and replied that he himself was superior in all respects to Kavus, that his empire was more extensive, and his warriors more numerous and brave. Have I not, said he, a hundred war elephants, and Kavus not one? Wherever I move, conquest marks my way. Why then should I fear the sovereign of Persia? Why should I submit to him? This haughty tone made a deep impression upon Farhad, who, returning quickly, told Kavus of the proud bearing and fancied power of the ruler of Mazandaran. Rustam was immediately sent for, and so indignant was he on hearing the tidings that every hair on his body started up like a spear, and he proposed to go himself with a second dispatch. The king was too much pleased to refuse, and another letter was written more urgent than the first threatening the enemy to hang up his severed head on the walls of his own fort, if he persisted in his contumacy and scorn of the offer made. As soon as Rostam had come within a short distance of the court of the King of Mazandaran, accounts reached his majesty of the approach of another ambassador, when a deputation of warriors was sent to receive him. Rostam observing them, and being in the sight of the hostile army, with a view to show his strength, tore up a large tree on the road by the roots, and dexterously wielded it in his hand like a spear. Tilting onwards, he flung it down before the wandering enemy, and one of the chiefs then thought it incumbent upon him to display his own prowess. He advanced, and offered to grasp hands with Rostam, they met, but the grip of the champion was so excruciating that the sinews of his adversary cracked, and in agony he fell from his horse. Intelligence of this discomfiture was instantly conveyed to the king, who then summoned his most valiant and renowned chieftain, Kalhor, and directed him to go and punish, signally, the warrior who had thus presumed to triumph over one of his heroes. Accordingly, Kalhor appeared, and boastingly stretched out his hand, which Rostam wrung with such grinding force that the very nails dropped off, and blood started from his body. This was enough, and Kalhor hastily returned to, to the king, and anxiously recommended him to submit to terms, as it would be in vain to oppose such invincible strength. The king was both grieved and angry at this situation of affairs, and invited the ambassador to his presence. After inquiring respecting Kavus and the Persian army, he said, And thou art Rostam, clothed with mighty power, who slaughtered the white demon, and now comest to crush the monarch of Mazandaran. No, said the champion, I am but his servant, and even unworthy of that noble station. My master being a warrior, the most valiant that ever graced the world since time began, nothing am I. But what doth he resemble? What is a lion, elephant, or demon engaged in fight? He is himself a host. The ambassador then tried to convince the king of of the folly of resistance, and of his certain defeat if he continued to defy the power of Kavus and the bravery of Rostam, but the effort was fruitless, and both sides prepared for battle. The engagement which ensued was obstinate and sanguinary, and after seven days of hard fighting, neither army was victorious, neither defeated. Afflicted at this want of success, Kavus grovelled in the dust, 
and prayed fervently to the Almighty to give him the triumph. He addressed all his warriors, one by one, and urged them to increased exertions, and on the eighth day, when the battle was renewed, prodigies of valour were performed. Rustam singled out and encountered the king of Mazandaran, and fiercely they fought together with sword and javelin, but suddenly, just as he was rushing on with overwhelming force, his adversary, by his magic art, transformed himself into a stony rock. Rostam and the Persian warriors were all amazement. The fight had been suspended for some time, when Kavus came forward to inquire the cause, and, hearing with astonishment of the transformation, ordered his soldiers to drag the enchanted mass towards his own tent. But all the strength that could be applied was unequal to move so great a weight, till Rostam set himself to the task, and amidst the wandering army, lifted up the rock and conveyed it to the appointed place. He then addressed the work of sorcery and said, If thou dost not resume thy original shape, I will instantly break thee, flinty rock as thou now art, into atoms, and scatter thee in the dust. The magician king was alarmed by this threat, and reappeared in his own form, and then Rostam, seizing his hand, brought him to Kavus, who, as a punishment for his wickedness and atrocity, ordered him to be slain, and his body to be cut into a thousand pieces. The wealth of the country was immediately afterwards secured, and at the recommendation of Rostam, Olad was appointed governor of Marzandaran. After the usual thanksgivings and rejoicings on account of the victory, Kavus and his warriors returned to Persia, where splendid honours and rewards were bestowed on every soldier for his heroic services. Rostam, having received the highest acknowledgments of his merit, took leave and returned to his father Zal at Sabolistan. Suddenly, an ardent desire arose in the heart of Kavus to survey all the provinces and states of his empire. He wished to visit Turan and Chin and Makran and Barbar and Zira. Having commenced his royal tour of inspection, he found the king of Barbaristan in a state of rebellion, with his army prepared to dispute his authority. A severe battle was the consequence, but the refractory sovereign was soon compelled to retire, and the elders of the city came forward to sue for mercy and protection. After this triumph, Kavus turned toward the mountain Kath, and visited various other countries, and in his progress became the guest of the son of Zal in Zabolistan, where he stayed a month, enjoying the pleasures of the festive board and the sports of the field. The disaffection of the king of Hamavaran, in league with the king of Mesir and Sham, and the still hostile king of Badbaristan, soon, however, drew him from Nimruz, and quitting the principality of Rostam, his arms were promptly directed against his new enemy, who, in the contest which ensued, made an obstinate resistance, but was at length overpowered, and obliged to ask for quarter. After the battle, Kavus was informed that the Shah had a daughter of great beauty, named Sudabe, possessing a form as graceful as the tall cypress, musky ringlets, and all the charms of heaven. From the description of this damsel he became enamoured, and through the medium of a messenger, immediately offered himself to be her husband. The father did not seem to be glad at this proposal, observing to the messenger that he had but two things in life valuable to him, and those were his daughter and his property. One was his solace and delight, and the other his support. To be deprived of both would be death to him. Still, he could not gainsay the wishes of a king of such power and his conqueror. 
He then sorrowfully communicated the overture to his child, who, however, readily consented, and in the course of a week the bride was sent escorted by soldiers, and accompanied by a magnificent cavalcade, consisting of a thousand horses and mules, a thousand camels, and numerous female attendants. When Sudave descended from her litter, glowing with beauty, with her rich dark tresses flowing to her feet, and cheeks like the rose, Cavus regarded her with admiration and rapture, and so impatient was he to possess that lovely treasure that the marriage rites were performed according to the laws of the country without delay. The Shah of Hamavaran, however, was not satisfied, and he continually plotted within himself how he might contrive to regain possession of Sudabe, as well as be revenged upon the king. With this in view, he invited Kavus to be his guest for a while, but Sudabe cautioned the king not to trust to the treachery which dictated the invitation, as she apprehended from it nothing but mischief and disaster. The warning, however, was of no avail, for Cavus accepted the proffered hospitality of his new father-in-law. He accordingly proceeded with his bride and his most famous warriors to the city, where he was received and entertained in the most sumptuous manner, seated on a gorgeous throne, and felt infinitely exhilarated with the magnificence and the hilarity by which he was surrounded. Seven days were passed in this glorious banqueting and delight, but on the succeeding night, the sound of trumpets and the war cry was heard. The intrusion of soldiers changed the face of the scene, and the king, who had just been waited on, and pampered with such respect and devotion, was suddenly seized, together with his principal warriors, and carried off to a remote fortress, situated on a high mountain, where they were imprisoned and guarded by a thousand valiant men. His tents were plundered, and all his treasure taken away. At this event his wife was inconsolable, and deaf to all entreaties from her father, declaring that she preferred death to separation from her husband, upon which she was conveyed to the same dungeon, to mingle groans with the captive king. Alas, how false and fickle is the world! Friendship nor pleasure, nor the ties of blood, can check the headlong course of human passions. Treachery still laughs at kindred, who was safe in this tumultuous sphere of strife and sorrow. End of The Seven Labours of Rostam by Fedosi. Some Myths and Legends of the Australian Aborigines by W. E. Thomas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sonrisa, Servision.org A Legend of the Great Flood In the dreamtime a terrible drought swept across the land. The leaves of the trees turned brown and fell from the branches. The flowers drooped their heads and died, and the green grass withered as though the spirit from the barren mountain had breathed upon it with a breath of fire. When the hot wind blew, the dead reeds rattled in the river bed, and the burning sands shimmered like a silver lagoon. All the water had left the rippling creeks and deep still water holes. In the clear blue sky the sun was a mass of molten gold. The clouds no longer drifted across the hills, and the only darkness that fell across the land was the shadow of night and death. After many had died of thirst, all the animals on the land met together in a great council to discover the cause of the drought. They traveled many miles. Some came from the bush and others from the distant mountains. The seabirds left their homes in the cliffs where the white surf thundered and flew without resting many days and nights. When they all arrived at the chosen meeting place in central Australia, they discovered that a frog of enormous size had swallowed all the water in the land and thus caused the drought. After much serious discussion, it was decided that the only way to obtain the water again 
was to make the frog laugh. The question now arose as to which animal should begin the performance, and after a heated argument, the pride of place was given to the kookaburra. The animals then formed themselves into a huge circle with the frog in the center. Red kangaroos, gray wallaroos, rock and swamp wallabies, kangaroo rats, bandicoots, native bears, and ring-tailed possums all sat together. The emu and the native companion forgot their quarrel, and the bellbird his chimes. Even a butcher bird looked pleasantly at a brown snake, and the porcupine forgot to bristle. A truce had been called in the war of the bush. Now the kookaburra seated himself on the limb of a tree, and with a wicked twinkle in his eye, looked straight at the big bloated frog, ruffled his brown feathers, and began to laugh. At first he made a low gurgling sound deep in his throat, as though he was smiling to himself, but gradually he raised his voice and laughed louder and louder until the bush re-echoed with the sound of his merriment. The other animals looked on with very serious faces, but the frog gave no sign. He just blinked his eyes and looked as stupid as only a frog can look. The kookaburra continued to laugh until he nearly choked and fell off the tree, but all without success. The next competitor was a frill lizard. It extended the frill around its throat and, puffing out its jaws, capered up and down. But there was no humor in the frog. He did not even look at the lizard, and laughter was out of the question. It was then suggested that the dancing of the native companion might tickle the fancy of the frog. So the native companion danced until she was tired, but all her graceful and grotesque figures failed to arouse the interest of the frog. The position was very serious, and the Council of Animals was at wit's end for a reasonable suggestion. In their anxiety to solve the difficulty, they all spoke at once, and the din was indescribable. Above the noise could be heard a frantic cry of distress. A carpet snake was endeavoring to swallow a porcupine. The bristles had stuck in his throat, and a kookaburra, who had a firm grip of his tail, was making an effort to fly away with him. Close by, two bandicoots were fighting over the possession of a sweet root, but while they were busily engaged in scratching each other, a possum stole it. Then they forgot their quarrel and chased the possum, who escaped danger by climbing a tree and swinging from a branch by his tail. In this peculiar position he ate the root at his leisure, much to the disgust of the bandicoots below. After peace and quiet had been restored, the question of the drought was again considered. A big eel, who lived in a deep waterhole in the river, suggested that he should be given an opportunity of making the frog laugh. Many of the animals laughed at the idea, but in despair they agreed to give him a trial. The eel then began to wriggle in front of the frog. At first he wriggled slowly, then faster and faster until his head and tail met. Then he slowed down and wriggled like a snake with the shivers. After a few minutes, he changed his position and flopped about like a well-bitten grub on an ant bed. The frog opened his sleepy eyes, his big body quivered, his face relaxed, and at last he burst into a laugh that sounded like rolling thunder. The water poured from his mouth in a flood. It filled the deepest rivers and covered the land. Only the highest mountain peaks were visible, like islands in the sea. Many men and animals were drowned. The pelican, who was a blackfellow at this time, sailed from island to island in a great canoe and rescued any blackfellow he saw. At last he came to an island on which there were many people. In their midst he saw a beautiful woman and fell in love with her. He rescued all the men on this island until the woman alone remained. Every time he made a journey, she would ask him to take her with the men, but he would reply, There are many in the canoe. I will carry you next time. He did this several times, and at last the woman guessed that he was going to take her to his camp. She then determined to escape from the pelican. While he was away, she wrapped a log in her possum rug and placed it near the gunya. Then, as the flood was subsiding, she escaped to the bush. When he returned, he called to her, but receiving no answer, he walked over to the possum rug and touched it with his foot. It, however, did not move. He then tore the rug away from what he supposed was a woman, but when he found a log he was very angry and resolved to be revenged. He painted himself with white clay and set out to look for the other black fellows with the intention of killing them. But the first pelican he met was so frightened by his strange appearance that it struck him with a club and killed him. 
Since that time, pelicans have been black and white in remembrance of the great flood. The flood gradually subsided, and the land was again clothed in the green garments of spring. Through the tall green reeds, the voice of the night wind whispered soft music to the river. And when the dawn came from the eastern sky, the birds sang a song of welcome to the new flood, a flood of golden sunlight. End of Some Myths and Legends of the Australian Aborigines by W. E. Thomas A Legend of the Great Flood